So marker. Okay, mask on, mask off. Uh, if you're comfortable with it, I'll, I'll go off. My name is Mark Belcher. I work as a chief lighting technician, which is more commonly known as a gaffer in the uh, film and television industry. This video was sponsored by MediaBox Camera. If you know me, I've worked with equipment and stage rental company MediaBox Camera and their owners for years, and they've been great partners on more productions than I can count. Based in Culver City, Los Angeles, they have a sizable collection of cameras, lenses, and AKS available to rent. If you're looking for camera equipment or space for your production, I can vouch for their team. And it just so happens that the video you're about to watch was shot on their stage. I've added a link in the description below for you to get started with MediaBox Camera. So the job of the CLT is multifaceted and that half of your job is aesthetics and half of it is technical and practicality. So you have safety concerns, electrical load concerns, weight concerns that all come into play when trying to craft an image. Part of your job is figuring out what you want things to look like and the other half of your job is taking all these technical considerations into play to make sure it's done safely and effectively and quickly. The relationship between the CLT and the director of photography, it, it varies between uh, different, different CLTs and DPs. Um, some is very collaborative. Sometimes the DP will come to me and say, I want it to look like this, figure out how to make it happen. And then other DPs will come to me and say, I want this light right there. And you just put the light right there. Uh, it, it really r ranges the gamut. And you just, as a CLT, you have to understand the type of DP you're working with to know how to best approach that relationship. Many DPs will come to me and say, this is my broader vision. This is the aesthetic I want to go for. What tools do you think we should bring to the table? And then it becomes a very collaborative effort. And then others will be like, no, bring this, bring this, bring that. I like this light right here. I like this light 30 degrees over the camera, five feet to the left, and then the job becomes pulling out the tape measure and just putting it where they ask. <laughs> the DPs I work most frequently with will come to me and say, what do you think the best way to do this is? This is what I want, and a lot of times they'll come to me with reference images or they'll send me a video clip from some other TV show or movie and be like, I want something that looks like this, you know, these shafts of light coming in or, you know, this real moody kind of thing or this toppy looking kind of thing. And then they'll be like, you know, what tools do you like working with that will achieve this effectively? Um, those are my favorite DPs to work with. And then in that case, I do get a lot of creative input also on the day, you know, and be like, hey, I think it would actually be better for what you're trying to achieve if we do it this way instead of the, you know, this other way that you suggested. My most collaborative DPs, you have to approach everything in a very diplomatic manner and say, hey, I think this might, I th let's try this. I think you might like what this will do. It's very similar to improv. It's yes and, never no. The only time it's no is if there's a serious safety concern. That's, that's the only time it becomes a no. The relationship with the grip department will make or break what you're able to do as a CLT. You really need to be on good terms and be able to work very closely with the grip department um, because they're the ones who are doing all the rigging to put the lights where you're requesting. They're the ones diffusing the lights and controlling the lights. There's really only so much you can do from the lighting department if you don't have the grip department on your side. With a great grip department, you can do some pretty amazing things. So it's a very close-knit relationship between the grips and the, uh, the lighting department. The aesthetics and safety and really every, every element of lighting, you need the grips. On a scout day, there's a number of things I'm looking for. First is ultimately, where is the scene taking place? Where do we want the lights? The staging of the equipment, where do we want the power to run? Also, what is the natural light doing in a location? Depending on, especially on a lower budget, you don't have the resources to necessarily overcome everything that's happening, especially not in every location. So sometimes you're taking meter readings to see, oh, how much sunlight actually does come through? What's the color? of the light coming through. Is there a funky window tent on these windows? You know, so if I do put a light outside, is it gonna turn really green coming through? And just kind of knowing what factors you're dealing with. Um, but it, 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 it's taking a lot of pictures also, you know, and then I'll look through the pictures after the scout day and developing a plan. So that way when we come to the location, we know 
80 to 90% what we're doing. You know, it always changes on the day when you show up and the actors get there and they're like, oh, let's go over here instead. But you, you wanna have an idea as to what you're gonna be doing before you get there. And a lot of times, if it's a larger, larger scene, larger set, you know, you'll even send a rigging team out to start executing the plan even before the shooting crew shows up. So then scouting becomes absolutely essential into figuring out what you wanna do, developing the plan, and then passing that plan off to a rigging gaffer to start ex executing the plan before I even show up on set. Normal shoot day. Is there a normal shoot day? <laughs> um, a normal shoot day involves, you know, getting the, showing up on the day, trucks parked, get the trucks unloaded, you know, usually why everybody's unloading the equipment, there's some sort of rehearsal that's happening. So uh, usually on a, on a movie set, uh, there'll be a private rehearsal that's just the actors and the directors, and then they do what's called a marking rehearsal, and that's where the uh, you know, key grip, the gaffer, the camera people will come in and watch you know, the scene that's about to take place. And uh, you look at where they stand, you look at where they say their lines, and then uh, you kind of have a sidebar with the DP and say, hey, uh, what do we want to do? And you know, depending on who you're working with, you know, they'll come up with, they'll either say, hey, let's have this coming through here, this coming through here. You probably talked about some of this stuff on the scout already. So, you know, you're, you're kind of already working lights into position, you know, especially for the background, even before you have the exact marks for the foreground. And then once you have those marks for the foreground, you're, you know, calling for lights and then looking at the monitor and you know setting levels and then you roll the cameras and you roll that shot, they move the cameras, you do it all over again. Rinse and repeat. I still use a light meter, um, not in the same way that you would with a film camera as much. Um, and it also depends on the DP I'm working with. Some DPs are just flying by the seat of their pants and it's not as critical. I'm not necessarily metering everything like you would in a film environment, although some DPs do want you to. A lot, I've worked with some DPs who just throw the camera on their shoulder and you're just rolling with it sometimes also. Um, but meter readings become essential if you're trying to match setups. Um, I worked on a documentary series recently where we were doing a very similar setup over the course of several months. So, and we wanted to be able to recreate that setup, um, especially if we had to come back and do follow-up interviews. So then it's taking meter, meter readings for uh, consistency purposes at that point. So that way you can come back and it looks exactly the same as when you were there before. You know, with scenes, um, if you're doing like a, a dramatic scene or something, meter readings are still helpful to know where your key level's at. So that way as you move the lights around, uh, everything stays the same. You don't have levels jumping up and down. Your ratios aren't changing constantly. Um, meter is also very helpful for uh, making like your bright parts of your frame consistent. So if you have like a bunch of lamps or windows and you know where you want those to land, uh, instead of guessing and doing something and then looking at the monitor, you can just pull your meter out and be like, okay, that needs to dim down up there. That's the spot. So the meter is still actually a very effective time-saving tool if used correctly. Color temperature is really the, the, one of the basic building blocks of color cinematography. Um, you know, it's the white light spectrum and knowing how to adjust that. Daylight looks much bluer than interior light. Also cloudy light looks bluer than sunset. Um, and knowing how the different color temperatures play into each other, you can actually create a more three-dimensional color image uh, by doing that. Shade is bluer than direct sunlight. So if you're creating an ambient top light, that might wanna be bluer than your key light, um, just to create some separation. Color temperature can also be used to affect mood. It doesn't necessarily have to be real. Uh, so you can warm things up to make them feel more intimate or close, or you can cool things off just to make them feel more distant, more detached. Using different color temperatures can really, really plays deeply into the aesthetic of the movie making process. One of the main parts of my job is using the right tool for the right job at the right time. So there's a vast array of lighting instruments. There's tungsten lights that come in, you know, Fresnels, they come in, scoop lights, they come in, open faces, 
uh, LED lights come in panels. They have LED Fresnels now as well. And knowing when to use a hard light versus a soft light and for what purpose uh, makes a huge difference. PARs serve a different purpose over Fresnels also. It's really, you know, do I want a hard shadow? Do I want a sharp shadow? Do I want a soft shadow? Am I building a soft, a large soft source? If I'm building a large soft source to key someone with, starting with a tiny hard light is not the best starting point. Uh, vice versa, if I want to create hard shadows, using a sky panel is the wrong choice. It's, it's all about knowing what, what different tools can offer. There's no, I can't tell you there's a right tool or a wrong tool to have on the truck, but there is a right tool and a wrong tool for a given situation. Maybe not a wrong tool, but there might be a better tool. Sometimes you end up using all the lights on the truck and you inevitably have to use the wrong tool for something and you're just bouncing it off a wall or bouncing it off a card because that's what you have left. Sometimes the right tool is just the tool you have and then you have to make it work. A couple of years ago, I had the opportunity to work on the Innocent Man a documentary series for Netflix, doing the recreations for that series. And I had a really fun time working on that uh, for a number of reasons. One, the DP I worked with, she's very collaborative and very fun to work with. Um, and also that series was partnering with the Innocence Project. And that project just felt very meaningful and that it had real world implications to it. So not only was I getting to do something creative, I was also doing something that had substance to it as well not just pure entertainment. I think for me, some of my favorite moments on set are, are less about the movie making process, but just like the memories I get to create with the people I'm working with. Uh, so for instance, I had one job where I got to fly out of state and we were working a lot and then we just had a you know, blast. Uh, hanging out with each other. Uh, that's happened on a number of different movies. Um, I worked on one TV show where we were getting off work early, like in like six hours every day, and then me and the crew would just go do an escape room after work. But I think those are some of my favorite moments, and I think that's some of the opportunities that the movie making community has that maybe you don't get in other, other lines of work. You know, there's a real camaraderie both inside of work and, and outside of work. Advice, oh man, don't do it. <laughs> Advice, uh, first, the first thing you should know is if you're looking to get into any, anything in television really is it's a lot of work. Um, you know, there's fun days where, you know, like I said, you know, it's like a family, you're goofing around and all of this. And there's some days where you're Starting work Friday night, you're seeing the sun come up Saturday morning and everybody's just not happy with each other. And like, if you're wanting to get into this field, you have to be in it for the long haul. Uh, you know, there's gonna be good days, there's gonna be bad days. You're gonna put a lot of hours in starting out for not a lot of money, probably, unfortunately. Um, but just know that eventually that work will pay off. And if you, if you stick it out, there is a rewarding career ahead of you. Going off walkie.